to your Bible to Esther chapter 2. <laughs> Esther chapter 2, we're going to look at verses 1 through verse 18. After these things, when the wrath of King Ahasuerus subsided, he remembered Vashti, what she had done and what had been decreed against her. Then the king's servants who attended him said, Let beautiful young virgins be sought for the king, and let the king appoint officers in all the provinces of his kingdom, that they may gather all the beautiful young virgins to Sushan, the citadel, into the women's quarters under the custody of Haggai, the king's eunuch, custodian of the women, and let beauty preparations be given them. Then let the young women who let the young woman who pleases the king be queen instead of Vashti. This thing pleased the king, and he did so. In Sushan the citadel, there was a certain Jew whose name was Mordecai, the son of Jair, the son of Shimei, the son of Kish, a Benjamite. Kish had been carried away from Jerusalem with the captives who had been captured when Jeconiah, king of Judah, whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had carried away. And Mordecai had brought up Hadassah, that is Esther, his uncle's daughter, for she had neither father nor mother. The young woman was lovely and beautiful. When her father and mother died, Mordecai took her as his own daughter. So it was when the king's command and decree were heard, and when many young women were gathered at Sushan the citadel, under the custody of Haggai, that Esther also was taken to the king's palace into the care of Haggai, the custodian of the women. Now the young, the young woman pleased him, and she obtained his favor, so he readily gave beauty preparations to her, besides her allowance. Then seven choice maidservants were provided for her from the king's palace, and he moved her and her maidservants to the best place in the house of the women. Esther had not revealed her people or family, for Mordecai had charged, charged her not to reveal it. And every day Mordecai paced in front of the court of the women's quarters to learn of Esther's welfare and what was happening to her. Each young woman's turn came to go to go into King Ahasuerus after she had completed 12 months preparation according to the regulations for the women. For thus were the days of their preparation apportioned, six months with oil of mirth and six months with perfumes and preparations for beautifying women. Thus prepared, each young woman went to the king, and she was given whatever she desired to take with her from the women's quarters to the king's palace. In the evening she went, and in the morning she returned to the second house of the women, to the custody, custody of Shazgaz, the king's eunuch who kept the concubines. She would not go in to the king again unless the king delighted in her and called for her by name. Now when the term... When the turn came for Esther, the daughter of Abihel, the uncle of Mordecai, who had taken her as his daughter to go in to, be, to the king, she requested nothing but what Haggai, Haggai, the king's eunuch, the custodian of the women, advised. And Esther obtained favor in the sight of all who saw her. So Esther was taken into King Ahasuerus into his royal palace in the tenth month, which is the month of Tibet, in the seventh year of his reign. The king loved Esther more than all the other women, and she obtained grace and favor in his sight more than all the virgins. So he set the royal crown upon her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. Then the king made a great feast, the feast of Esther, for all his officials and servants, and he proclaimed a holiday in the provinces and gave gifts according to the generosity of the king. There's a popular TV show that's out. Maybe some of you all have heard of it. Maybe some of you have watched it, but uh, it's called The Bachelor. It's been around for about 20 years now. Uh, and just in case you are, are, might be wondering, I have never watched the show. Uh, it's not something that would interest me. But on the show, it centers around one man that uh, is The Bachelor, and they bring in all of these young, beautiful women a uh, big group of them, and then he handpicks each one that he wants, and, and they go through a series of, I think, six weeks, and they, he weeds them down until he finally gets down 
to the one woman that he wants to propose to. Uh, you know, the thought of that kind of sounds like a good plan. We'll just bring everybody in and we'll let you pick. Uh, it sounds like something that would be the right thing to do, you know, to, to help this, this poor bachelor find the woman of his dreams. But the reality of it is that there's all kinds of debauchery that takes place on this show. There's drama between the women and jealousy can run rampant. They might as well have called it another name for it. Could have been the Jerry Springer dating game. And if any of you all are familiar with Jerry Springer and his show in the in the 80s and 90s, uh, of all the nonsense that he had on there, uh, this very well could have been a show that he uh, might have been involved in. But this show, this show is nothing new. Uh, it's nothing new at all. If when you, when the Bible says that there's nothing new, I think this is kind of what it means. Uh, this show was actually set up uh, back for King Ahasuerus. And we'll see that very eerily similarity in our scriptures today. Uh, King Ahasuerus remembers that he had gotten rid of his queen Vashti. She's gone. She's out of the picture. And he's finding that he's lonely. So uh, his servants come up with the ideal of the bachelor. They're going to bring in all these women. They're going to parade in the prettiest and the purest of women for the king to choose which one that he's going to make the next queen. But unlike the Bachelor TV show, these women didn't volunteer for the assignment. You see, on the TV show, the women volunteered to put themselves through all of this so that they could get uh, fame and fortune for a few moments. But these women that the king brought in, they didn't volunteer for any of this. The king sent out his people, uh, his officers, to go out and to bring back all of the women. Now let me ask you something. Can you imagine uh, you dads or even your, your mothers of uh, young women? Could you imagine somebody coming by and taking up your child and taking them off to the palace? and they're no longer yours, they're for the king's use. Could you imagine that happening to <laughs> one of your children? In 2019, there was 11,500 situations of human trafficking that were reported to the U.S. National Human Trafficking Hotline. 11,500 in 2019 of kids being abducted and taken into the human trafficking. I don't know if y'all saw the news. I, I, I saw it briefly, but there was a story about, and I can't remember where it was, but uh, some officers raided a home and they found 90 people inside this home. And then they quickly realized that it was a human trafficking thing, so they brought in the right people. This is a very real thing in our country. Our young women, our young men are being taken away and carried off and put into this industry. And a lot of the problems come with children that might be disgruntled with their parents. Children that don't like the way their parents are doing things. They think their parents are too strict or too tough and they turn to the internet to find a sympathetic ear, and what they're looking for is another teen that's going through the same thing that they're going through, and, and, and then they go, you know what, maybe we should just run away together, and, and then the young girl or young boy goes out to meet this person, and they find out that it's an adult, and then they kidnap the child, and that child's gone. We definitely have a problem with that in this country. It happens far too often. And if you don't believe me, you can look anywhere at, at how many kids are missing in our country today. How many kids have been classified as a runaway that maybe they were actually taken away instead of running away. But regardless of what our situation is here in this country, back in the time of King Ahasuerus, if you're the king, you get to do whatever you want. You can go take whoever you want. You can claim whatever property you want. And he certainly did that. He sent out his men to search and to find the best of the best and to bring them back so that he could 
pick and choose which one he wanted. And one of those women was Esther. Look back at verses 5 through 11. In Sushan, the citadel, there was a certain Jew whose name was Mordecai, the son of Jair, the son of Shimei, the son of Kish, a Benjamite. Kish had been carried away from Jerusalem with the captives who had been captured when Jeconiah, king of Judah, whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had carried away. And Mordecai had brought up Hadashah, that is Esther, his uncle's daughter, for she had neither father nor mother. The youngest woman was the young woman was lovely and beautiful. When her father and mother died, Mordecai took her as his own daughter. So it was when the king's command and decree were heard, and when many young women were gathered at Sushan the citadel under the custody of Haggai, that Esther was also taken to the king's palace into the care of Haggai, the custodian of the women. Now the young women pleased the young woman pleased him, and she obtained his favor. So he readily gave beauty preparations to her, besides her allowance. Then seven choice maidservants were provided for her uh, from the king's palace. And he moved her and her maidservants to the best place in the house of the women. Esther had not yet revealed her people or family, for Mordecai had charged her not to reveal it. And every day Mordecai paced in front of the court of the women's quarters to learn of Esther's welfare and what was happening to her. Esther's parents had died and, and that left her to be raised with her cousin Mordecai. And Mordecai raised her as his own daughter and he cared deeply for her so much that he spent every single day walking back and forth outside of the palace where she was being kept to find out what's going on with her. And I think many of you parents can relate when something's going on with our kids, we want to know what is going on. We want to know how we can help them. And certainly Mordecai was in that boat. You see, Mordecai's great-grandfather was taken, his great-grandfather Kish, he was taken into custody when uh, Nebuchadnezzar came in and took the Jews captive. Now, the... The time between Nebuchadnezzar, when Nebuchadnezzar was the king and he took them, to when Cyrus, who I talked about last week, came in and took over King Nebuchadnezzar, to his son Darius, and now down to Ahasuerus, that was over 110 years in between those times when the Jews were taken away. And we know that, that Cyrus certainly let some of the Jews go back if they wanted to. Uh, so when we, when we take that into account, we find that Mordecai and Esther, they were born in captivity. They were born in captivity, and that's where they chose to stay. They could have easily went back to Jerusalem. They could have went back to their people, but instead they just stayed in their situation. Why do people do that? Because it's comfortable to them. This is all they've known. They were raised here, they were born here, they were raised here, so they're going to stay there. We are born into the captivity of sin. We are sinners right from the start. We're born into sin. And something has to come on us to change us from our life of sin. And that's the work of the Holy Spirit. You see, the Holy Spirit comes into our life to draw us out of sin and take us into a godly life. But for Mordecai and Esther, they just stayed put. They just stayed there. And in that, God was still working. God is always working in our situations. Mordecai instructed Esther, don't tell them that you're a Jew. Don't tell anybody that you're a Jew. Because if they were to find out that a Jew was in the palace of the king, what would they do to you? They'd probably kill you. And then they would kill me as well. So don't tell them that you're one of the lowly slaves that live in this area. Don't mention it to them. So she kept quiet. And she didn't say anything. Look at verses 12 through 18. Each young woman's turn came to go into, into King Ahasuerus after she had completed 12 months of preparation according to the regulations for the women. For thus were the days of their 
preparation of portion. Six months with the oil of myrrh and six months with perfumes and preparations for beautifying women. Thus prepared, each young woman went to the king and she was given whatever she desired to take with her from the woman's quarters to the king's palace. In the evening she went and in the morning she returned to the second house of the women to the custody of Shazgaz, the king's eunuch, who kept the concubines. She would not go into the king again unless the king delighted in her and called for her by name. Now when the turn came for Esther, the daughter of Abihel, the, the uncle of Mordecai, who had taken her as his daughter to go into the king, she requested nothing but what Haggai, the king's eunuch, the custodian of the women, advised. And Esther obtained favor in the sight of all who saw her. So Esther was taken into King Ahasuerus into his royal palace in the 10th month, which is the month of Tibet, in the seventh year of his reign. The king loved Esther more than all the other women, and she obtained grace and favor in his sight more than all the virgins. So he set the royal crown upon her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. Then the king made a great feast, the feast of Esther, for all his officials and servants, and he proclaimed a holiday in the provinces and gave gifts according to the generosity of the king. If you'll remember, the king banished Vashti after his third year of uh, power. And now we find ourselves in the seventh year of his reign. So the king waited four years. He waited a year just for the women to be made perfect for him. But he's been waiting for a new queen for four years. And these women, as they went through their full year of treatment, all the women were beautiful. But for some reason, they said, let's add these beauty beautifying treatments to make you even more spectacular. They had six months of oil treatments that was to soften up their skin and give it that glow. And then they had six months of perfumes and other treatments. So they went way out of their way to, to make these women so appealing to the king. And then came the time for each of them to have their time with the king. They were to be presented to the bachelor, the king Ahasuerus, so that he could have his one night stand with each of them. And then he would determine which one was going to be made queen. Now, when we think about Esther, she was beautiful. The scriptures tell us that. She had a magnetic personality. She was well liked by everybody that met her. So she had an advantage over all the other women. Not only was she pretty, but she had a good personality. And the king certainly saw that, just the same as his servant saw that. And Haggai treated her special. He treated her differently than all the other women. He put her in the best of the best rooms. And then Esther was made queen instead of Vashti. You see what God was doing? God was setting the stage for all the Jews to be saved. To be set free to, to go and, and to live and rebuild Jerusalem. God was setting the stage for that to happen. He was setting the stage for the Jews to be saved so that they wouldn't be killed just for being Jewish. Now, I don't know what you're going through in your life, but I know each of us is going through something right now. Each of us has a trial that we're going through that might be difficult. And maybe we don't quite understand all the things that's going on. But I can tell you that God is working in each of your circumstances. He's working for the good of His people. He's working to save us all from an eternity in hell. God is doing everything He can to reach us with the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ so that we'll turn to Him and seek His salvation and forgiveness of our sins. That we might trust Him through whatever trial we're going through and know that in the end, it'll be for our good and it'll lead to God's glory. You see, God is setting the stage to res rescue us from this ungodly world that we're living in. As I've been preaching for the last year, I think we're very close to the end times. God is setting the stage for us to be taken up. All we have to do is be patient 
and trust Him that He's working it out. And if we have faith, through our faith, through our dedication, Jesus will save us. And He'll help us through any trial if we'll just trust God to see it through. But you see, that's where the problem comes in. People don't trust God to see them through the situations. We all have that fault in our genes that, that we doubt what God is doing. But I can tell you God is always working for our good to bring us back home into his kingdom. So that we can say in my father's house, he has a place for me. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the life of Mordecai and Esther and the dedication that they had to see it through. No matter what was going on, they trusted in you to see that through. And we're going to find that out as we continue to go on through the book of Esther. Father, just thank you for the faithful people that you uh, recorded in the scriptures for us to look back and see how they lived their life so that we can trust and live that same way. Father, that we can follow you no matter what. Uh, it doesn't matter what trial we're going through. You are always there to help us through it. And God, we are so thankful to you, to you for that. Now, Father, we come to this invitation time. We give it to you, Father. I pray that you work on everybody's heart and help them to see and understand what you're doing in their lives. Father, I pray that you help me as a pastor to understand and, and to stand strong and to have the courage to lead no matter what this world throws at us. Father, we all need your help. We can't do this without you. We must have you present in our lives. We must have you leading the way. And Father, we can only do that through a love that is deeply devoted to you. Father, we need to have that dedication. And Father, if we don't have that dedication, then this is the time for you to speak to our hearts, to help us to understand that, to seek after you, you and your kingdom. Father, we give this time to you, work in our hearts. We love you and we praise you in the name of Jesus. Amen.